There we go. Kelly, did you want to pull up the PowerPoint? Did you? Have yeah. One? Okay. Maybe. Maybe. It's just a little slow. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so the next slide, um, we do go into that we want you guys to put your names and stuff in the chat box. But since this is such a small group and um, I have all of your guys' contact information, we won't need to worry about this at this point. Um, but we do ask that you just stay on mute unless you have a question. This is pretty informal, so don't hesitate to ask any questions throughout. Um, and then you can always put um, any questions in the chat box as well. Okay, great. Um, so this first slide just lets you know that um, we don't expect you to have all of your policies and procedures emailed to us at a certain time. We will just look at them um, and have you submit some of them to us uh, during your annual survey. So when we come out again in September, October, that'll be when we'll want to see your updated policies and procedures updated to the new rule 1604.18. Um, and obviously the slides were not highlighting every single change that was made to the rules, but we're showing you the ones that are, we think, most impactful for you. And uh, let's see, we will start surveying to the new rules um, on July 1st. So when you get, when your next survey comes up, which is usually, usually around September, October, you guys will be expected to be following the new rules at that time. In the meantime, we'll provide technical assistance, which is just, you know, helping you um, meet the new rules until you're required to. Big one, you guys probably already know, um, you don't have, we are no longer requiring a TB test for your staff. You can continue to do that if that's your policy and that's what you want to do, but it's not something that we will be looking at. Hey, Kelly. Yeah. Can I talk about the temporals in the beginning here? I don't want to. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, I'm sorry. I <laughs> sorry. I forgot. I wasn't sure. I was like, didn't Freddie have a part? But I couldn't remember. I, I did. I have my part in the very beginning and then I'm, I'm out. No. Um, so I did. I, I did want to let providers know that we did have to submit temp rules with the on so I'm sorry temporary rules that impact our new this new chapter so it was really interesting timing um while we were going through the approval for this new chapter with the legislature we had to do temporary rules and take them to the board of health and welfare um at the same time so it's pretty a unique situation but what happened was we have to submit any rules um, we develop to the FBI so they can get approval for the state to conduct background checks on our providers. So when we did that, we submitted what's what you guys see in the rule that's published right now, and the FBI actually rejected that language. So we found out right pretty much right when the legislature went into session it might have been a little before that, um, that that they were denied. So what that meant was our criminal history unit was unable to process our providers' background checks because of that rejection we received. So what we did is we developed some temporary rules. Um, and what we did in those temporary rules is we took the, the FBI basically said, um, you, you have not identified, the, we need you to identify the actual classes of individuals that will get fingerprinted. And right now, if you go in and read, um, I think the 009 section, you'll see it real general language. So these temp rules went in front of the Board of Health and Welfare and got approved to go in effect signee die 
but they won't be published until after our May administrative bulletin. I worked really hard at not making this confusing and I think I just made it really confusing. So basically what um, what you will see is here, we don't know when it'll get published, but it, sh it should be this month. They will publish these temp rules in the current chapter that you see that's published right now, but there'll be a T at the end of the temp, each temp rule. And, but I don't, I do not believe it will impact you guys at all other than the numbers, the rules fall under, because what we had to do is just go and instead of saying individuals that have contact with children, we had to go in and identify the administrator, the owner, the, we had to go direct care staff. We had to go field supervisors, right? We had to go in and identify specific titles of who um, who works for you guys. So that is really all that changed in those temp rules because it's federally mandated because the FBI, um, we, we need the FBI to allow us to do background checks. We will not have any negotiated rule meetings around it. Um, but we will have some hearings if there's some problems around the rule that how the rules are written. So I did want to let you know that that is going into, we should see those published in the next month, hopefully in the next month. And really it will visually look different to you. Um, but how you guys do criminal history at this point should not change at all. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is we will, these will be taken to the legislature next legislative session to, for approval. So then they become final if they get approved. So since I worked really hard at not confusing you, do you guys have questions? Cause I probably confused you a little bit. Oh, I'm thoroughly confused. Um, but that, that it sounds like we're okay. Um, as far as, as far as what they go. Um, and. You were talking about background checks, but you have up here uh, your your definition of of changes, uh, noteworthy changes, and so like those are kind of a little bit different. But you were talking about two thirty one, is that correct? Inside there, the excuse me, the background the background checks is what section? So I can zero zero nine, I believe. Yeah. So it is zero zero nine, guys, right? Yeah, yeah, it is zero zero nine. Yeah. Okay. So, so Cliff, I think the only rule numbers that will be affected by those changes will be in the zero to two hundred, which is that administrative part of the rules, like the definitions and all of that. So, if you're numbering and you're looking at your policies, the two hundred, you know, all the way through the five hundreds, those numbers should not will not change at all. Those are permanent. Is that okay. correct, Patty? Yeah, yeah, that yeah, 100% correct. So the one thing we did have to do is you heard this all last year is um, if we added words, even in the temporals, we had to remove the same amount of words. So we did have to do some um, modifying or revisions in the zero to 200 to make sure that we met that 20 per, or that reduction that we're required to meet. So so really it's the numbers and we'll let you know once we know they're published what we'll send an email out right guys hopefully yeah. and uh, let you know that these temp rules have been have been published yeah okay i think my part's done unless someone has more questions around the temp rules okay okay we're good okay good all right, and then we just wanted to let you know that we did um, define escort. Um, and so it's within, so the definition of physical restraint intervention was updated to any intervention utilized to control the range of motion of an individual, including escort to assist a child in moving from one location to another. So this means that if your staff is obviously moving a child from one location to another, then you will have to follow the restraint documentation requirement. You guys probably already do that if you restrain, right? 
Just to ask a clarifying question, this would be in a situation, right, where we need to get somebody back to safety versus like taking them to um, like one of their activities, yes? It depends on if you're putting your hands on them, right? If you're putting your hands on them and you have your hand on their, their wrist and their back or their shoulder and you're pulling them or pushing them, you know, um, so for that reason. So like if they run away, and you go and you catch them and you're bringing them back and you're physically bringing them back, then you would write it up as a restraint. Heard kind of what we do already, so thank you. And then your license um, uh, can be effective up to 12 months unless suspended or revoked. And so we changed that language. It used to just be annually. And so now um, we can issue a license for less than 12 months. So let's say, you know, we, you had a lot of citations and we wanted to check on you sooner and help you, you know, get back into compliance. Then we might give you a three month license or a six month license. Um, so it gives uh, the freedom to be able to do that. And then um, all new applicants will receive a six month license so that we can provide them with some technical assistance and help and they don't have to, you know, be going for a whole year without having us um, assist them. Renewal application. So this is a little bit different. Um, the process has changed a little bit. So 60 days prior to the expiration of your license, you will go into um, the CRL portal, which you access through the website and you well, actually, yes, and you will um, submit your application, which is just, um, you know, a page or two and it asks you a few questions and then you sign it. So you don't have to submit any documents at that time. And then after we receive your application, then we will send you um, the letter that says, this is when your survey is, this is when your documents are due. Um, but we want you to initiate um, that process 60 days before your license expires. Odessa, oh, when does when does Blue Forest license expire? Do you have a date on that? Oh, you're muted, Odessa. Uh, yeah, let me pull it up real quick. Clef and I can tell you. I'm just saying if it's if it's September and it's 60 days beforehand, then that really means July 1, right? Yeah. So one thing to note while you guys are looking that up is this is actually in statute. Um, there, it was not expected prior, you know, before we rewrote rule to do it this way. But after we read law, right, <laughs> we were like, we need we need to move forward with um, complying with the law. So really, this is something that is was written in statute, goodness, years and years ago. So yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure Blue, Kathy likes to be well ahead of the thing on on these kind of things. So I don't think that that's really a problem. But just to make sure, I just want to make sure that they've got a, a day that they know. Probably my guess is it's going to be you're going to want to have the application through the portal be submitted by July 1 would make it safe. And that would probably be. We expire 10, 11 of 23. Gotcha. So actually uh, August. August. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think that we do it online. We did it online last year. I, re I remember right. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's all my question. Okay. Awesome. And now we have a, a new process called focus to survey. Um, so a focus survey will, you know, be that we will look at fewer files. And um, you can have a focus survey if you've been licensed for at least three years, you have received five or fewer deficiencies um, in your most recent survey or any mid-year statement of deficiency, and you didn't have any um, criminal history, medication, child health record, or a child dental record, or any repeat deficiencies. So if I'm remember right, you guys are probably pretty close to that. I'll, I'll ha I'd have to look, but um, we'll see. Okay. 
And the reporting requirements um, have been updated. So when you go into the CRL portal to make a reporting requirement, um, you'll see that all of these items are included. So anything, if there's a fire, a hospitalized child, um, if law enforcement is, um, you know, called out and a child is detained or arrested, um, a suicide attempt that requires an external emergency response or an emergency room visit, and a missing or runaway child, and then death of a child, obviously, and then you'll, you'll report those through the portal. Okay, one last clarification on that. I think we had talked about it maybe during the processing. Um, I mean, was the missing or when the child has eloped, which I think is a great term, um, was including that word in there, eloped. And that has always been one of the questions that comes up, Arlie, is what's the clock? How long do we have to look for the child before we have to report? And, and that still seems like a little vague. Can, can you give us some clarity on that about when? Yeah, yeah, I think it is a little vague. I think it depends, right? It depends on the needs of that particular child. So, you know, if that child is, you know, one of the younger ones or they're maybe they're new to your facility, um, you know, you're, you're going to have more urgency than um, someone you know who likes to kind of walk off and then they come back in 10 minutes after they've blown off steam and they're fine. Um, so, so it is, there really is no exact answer to that question. Okay. Yeah, just, just check and see if there's some clarity there. Thanks. Sorry. Kelly, did you mention, um, and I'm sorry, I, I accidentally was multitasking, um, the the supervisory, uh, what, sorry, where is it, where we say the um, supervision needs? Yeah. You talked about that, where it really is no. about that. Oh, okay. okay cause I, I, I just kind of talked about the needs of the child, but you're right, pointing out the supervisory needs of the child as well. Yeah, and I think that would help uh cliff to bring to ba you know each individual um if someone is able i think we actually talk about that supervision needs in rule um because because we use that word to tie it into what what was appropriate for kids so it really is about the individual needs like if they are able to go and you know, need quiet time and you guys allow people to go have kids go to have quiet time for a moment, you would, you know, and they kind of are out of sight. You wouldn't have to report that if you know that you can, you know, they just kind of are going to, this is, a, your guys' program is tough because <laughs> they're going to wander off and they're going to end up in the, the wilderness, right? But, um, but it really is focusing on that the the supervision needs of that individual child and how you know where you guys as the business and the clinical team have determined what's safe for that individual and what isn't. Right. The, and I know that probably didn't help very much, but it really ties it into that supervision needs of that individual child, right? Kelly, would you, yeah. Chrissy, would you guys agree? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, my thinking, and Ashley can correct me on this, my thinking on this is, is going to be along the lines about, like, the clock that I always have in my head when I was out there chasing is, when could they possibly contact their parents, right? You know, like, so if they're a mile from a road and they could be at a phone in 30 minutes, 30 minutes is my clock. You know, if they're, uh, you know, if they're eight miles from the nearest road, then my clock is a couple hours. You know, like when they would, would notify or make contact with outside agencies. Just don't want the sheriff to find out I've got a that Blue Fire's got a missing kid before I notify the sheriff that there's a missing kid. Kind of kind of frame. I don't know, actually, if you have any input on that. What's the, like? What's the frame? What's the time frame that you use? What's the guideline? So for us, um, I I tend to be really conservative. Um, I know that the sheriff agency that we work with majority of the time in our field operating area is Lincoln County. Um, if we do have a 
a kiddo out of sight. Um, he does like to be notified within 15 minutes or so. Um, but I, I do also see what you guys are saying, right? If it's a, a newer client or uh, perhaps a more high risk kind of level two, that might be different than a you know, 17 year old who walks behind a rock for five minutes to sit down before coming back. Um, I do love cut and dry parameters. I love numbers, so it would be nice to have, but I do see the intention where you guys are coming from. Yeah. Well, and I really think this would go back to the business, what you guys identify, right? Like, would we come in if you have a level three kid? I, maybe I just made that number up, but they could, they could go sit behind a rock and would we issue citation because you didn't let us know within 15 minutes, right? No, we wouldn't, but you guys need to follow your own policies around that. And that's kind of where it comes back down to you guys are going to kind of tell us what, how your business functions and based on the needs of your kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And in the new rules, um, a case manager, I mean, a service worker is now called a case manager. And you, you know, I'm, you must have at least one case manager. Um, and it doesn't say how long the case man, how many hours a week the case manager has to work. Um, and the case manager no longer for outdoor program and for residential the case manager no longer has to have a bachelor's degree they can have five years uh, five years of experience working with children in a social services setting so your case manager is the person who writes the um service plan usually mm -hmm. And you guys have therapists out there, so, you know, you guys definitely overachieve on this rule. But you'll see the word case manager throughout the rules, and that's taking the place of service worker. Um, we have added that orientation now needs to be, be completed within the first week of employment. Um, and just the orientation as far as these four items, um, the purpose of your organization, your policies and procedures, and your um, job responsibilities, and the reporting requirement that you have to report child abuse or neglect if you suspect it. And then for training, we took out the 25 hours of initial training so that a, a new person doesn't have to get 25 hours of training. They have to have training on the following topics. So the topics that are listed um, here would be for a, a new employee, specific instruction on job responsibilities, policies and procedures, child safety, CPR and first aid. Um, they have to get that within 90 days after employment and that and maintain it during their employment and then job shadowing so part of their um initial training needs to be job shadowing and then we made another category for initial and annual training so in addition to the things that i just talked about for um for new employees they would have to have um, training on child abuse, neglect, or abandoned identification. So identification is a little bit, you know, that's different than um, reporting. And then emergency procedures, child development appropriate to the population served, cultural sensitivity and diversity, and behavior management and mental health issues appropriate to the population served. So when we're looking at annual training for your staff, for your ongoing staff, these are the categories that we want to see that they've had some training in. Any questions on that orientation and training? Okay, and then staff ratios for wilderness. Um, each group of children must have one staff for every four children. Where there are four children or less, there must be at least two staff. Is that what you guys currently do? Perfect. And then. Can I go back to that? Just one last thing. There was a notation that I had uh, previously about there had been a requirement previous that if there was 
uh, a group of uh, mixed gendered uh, mixed gendered uh, students or clients that there had to be like at least one staff member of the same gender inside that group, and that looked like it was removed. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Gotcha. Okay, great. And then um, you do have to complete your discharge summary now within seven days of discharge. And your discharge summary, it used to be called aftercare plan. Um, now it has um, things that need to be in it. Um, the date and reason for discharge, the physical, emotional, medical, and educational needs of the child at the time of discharge, and any re recommendations you have for treatment. Um, so now we're just saying what minimally needs to be in your discharge plan and that it needs to be done within seven days. And then we also included the disrupted placement documentation. You can include that in your discharge plan or your discharge summary, which includes um, assessing the cause and any corrections the organization may need to make to prevent um, a dis to prevent that to that ah, any changes that you might need to have made to prevent the disrupted placement. So maybe, you know, you missed something at admissions or something like that, then you would write that down that you guys talked about what caused that particular disruption. May I ask one more clarifying question going back to Cliff's last question? Yeah. yeah. When Cliff, uh, when you brought it up, you said that you had read that um, if there was a mixed gendered group, uh, the same gender or sex requirement has been removed. Um, does that uh, go along for like same gendered groups, for example, like if there was an all boys group, um, is there still that gender requirement or has that changed as well? I'm going to check. So I believe that we have, we changed <clears throat> staffing within our rule for really your guys's clinical assessment of the groups that are out there and what the needs are of those groups um, in terms of who is maybe going to work better with them. Um, Cause we know that there's a lot of children that have gender identity questions. Um, or, you know, so I believe that we've adjusted staffing to allow for your guys' clinical assessment on that. Yeah, I don't see that we... Yeah, because in 504, which is just staff ratios and group sizes, it just talks about um, what was noted in the previous slide. Okay, yeah. Hmm. And there, there is um, like the age requirement for grouping is still in there. Um, okay. Yeah, I believe that's five twenty one age requirement. Yeah. Okay. And then expedition evaluations, each expedition must be evaluated once during a calendar week, either in person by a field director or as detailed in the organization's approved policies and procedures. I think we went over this one quite a bit because we were trying to figure out when the week was. <laughs> yes, you did. And thank you very much for clarifying that. That makes it so we're not out of compliance every week with half the groups in the field. So that, I, and I, I assume for the for the purposes of, of, of information is a standard week is Sunday through Saturday. And I would make that assumption. Yeah. Okay. Okay, first aid kits, uh, you no longer have to do a monthly first aid kit inventory. Um, you do need to, you know, inventory them and restock them as needed, but um, we won't be asking for monthly inventories anymore. And of course they still, oops, they'll still need to have um, all of the materials in them in order to provide, a, you know, emergency first aid to a child. Okay. 
And we changed the communication support system to just say that there must be multiple reliable communication systems. <laughs> <laughs> there also was a, a change and think again, thank you very much for that one. And the other one was the associated with the communication was there must be daily communication with the groups. And oh, yeah. it, it had been daily uh, verbal communication with the groups. And thank you for the, both of those changes. Those really made life a lot better. And they don't have to learn how to read the stars anymore or, wh or whatever that was. <laughs> yeah, no more celestial navigation. Although I can teach it, but it, you know, it's like, it's like, uh... <laughs> Okay, and cleansing of hands. Soap and water or other methods to disinfect hands is provided and encouraged after each latrine use. Cleansing of hands is required prior to food preparation. But I know we had some discussion on that as well. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I think, the, and you know, this is, those are like the highlights for um, wilderness. I have, they, they, they are pretty much the highlights. Um, just a point of clarity. So just so you know, the blue fire is well ahead of the, well ahead of the game on this one. Uh, they contracted with me to go ahead and write these up and transfer those policies across from one to another one. And I've already completed that task. And, and one of the reasons I completed that task is uh, that there was an email that you all sent out, I think it was in February, that said, just a reminder, folks, that these rules become effective on the on the day that Sunny Die occurs. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, oh, my God. I was anticipating that they would become effective on July 1 at the at the beginning of that and so we actually got them all done and, and i think they're all printed out by odessa and 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 ready to go uh, by sunny dive we managed that's to get awesome done. yeah that's awesome which was april 6th this year yeah, yeah. It, they, they were they, the session ran a little later than uh, than normal but yeah sunny die was april 6th and then um we were told we could have some time to, you know, do technical assistance and help everyone get into compliance. So we don't have to be super strict with the April 6th date. I mean, those are the rules as of April 6th, but um, we don't have to cite you on them, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. Not, Cliff, we're not real sure, nor, and you're right. I think his, his history dictates that most rules would go into effect July 1st. This year, we knew we knew we couldn't because 160602 was signy die. And if they went signy die effective, we would have no rules, right? So we had to go signy die this year. But what we're finding is even the programs that requested July 1st to be effective date, they aren't. And so our criminal history unit, which might be something you guys might want to look at, they rewrote their rules. It's guys, do you remember 1606? What is there? 160506. 160506. There are new criminal history rules that will impact you guys. They expected theirs to go in go into effect July 1st, and they found out in April they were in effect already. So Unfortunately, that was, I don't have no idea what happened at another division or above our heads um, that made all these rules go into effect. But I would recommend you guys reading 160506 because we do enforce those rules, even though they're not our rules and there were changes. And did you guys get an email from Criminal History Unit yesterday, the other day? Does anyone get emails from Criminal History Unit? Odessa, does anybody yeah, do we get? Um, I don't remember seeing one from them. They're Misty now called Stern. Background Check Unit, BCU now, I think. Odessa, perhaps we should check in with Misty too. I know she does a lot of that communication. I just don't know off the top of my head. So I, I one can four forward, days ago. I could, so we just got one April 28th. That came That's when out. I got mine. You did. I got it. Okay, so you know that he's saying, oh, guess what? Our rules are in effect, right? Okay, perfect. Yep. You got it. That's awesome. So know that the, that happened. So yes, we were hoping July 1st to Cliff, just so you know, but we um, unfortunately, I'm not sure where it all changed, but it did. So 
I, I just want to assure you all that I, I believe that this is correct is that I think that we're totally in compliance. The rules are in place and the policy have all been transferred across. So those should all be up and running for us. So we're at least ahead of the game. Yay, awesome. Do you have any questions while you were working through all the rules? The odd one for me, honestly, was, yeah, I was, as I was working through them and transferring, one, I had the first sheet that I had to create was uh, a transliteration guide, you know, like 826 is the new 531 or whatever it is. <laughs> and it would be nice if you published an official transliteration guide. That would be nice. Um, I made I made one for me so that all of us have memorized all the 500s and 800 rules and now have to memorize like where they at and the new ones. That was it. That was one. And I think I found a spot where you guys can save a lot of numbers of words in your next iteration of this. Okay. And there, there's two spots that require emergency plans, and they're effectively the same plan. We, uh, we know we we Kelly, I think identified that right, Kelly. Yeah. Um, where it was good because I was like, good, red flag that. So when we have to remove words, there you go, right? That's so, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I just wrote one emergency plan and then at the second item that required it said like reference this plan over yeah. here. I didn't rewrite it twice. And so um I just want to make sure you guys got that word that it's like red flag that one and you can remove like a bunch of words out of the next generation. That's a good eye, Cliff. <laughs> yes, it yeah. is. So so other than that, really they no questions. I mean, there there were some questions. I mean, and I I think that the the big question that I had that I had to go to to town with people on were things like uh, that definition of the service worker, case manager. What's a therapist to us? What's a, mm -hmm. a thing like that? It's still a bit foggy. We just went with effectively what we had before, um, but it was still that was a little bit of a muddled section in there um, yeah. that, about some clarity about what that means for service manager, service worker. Yeah. That was a muddy section. Oh, oh, <laughs> Ashley's nodding her head going like, yeah, that's, that's a little bit of a muddy section. Is but, it muddy because we call them something different than you guys? Or is it muddy because the way the rule is written, it, what, like what's muddy about it? it? It's muddy. Well, one is, is the name, you know, like, so uh, what, what that is. And the second one is the roles that they fill. Oh, so, sure. Yeah, and so those two things, trying to marry those two up. In previous itinerations, you know, we've had like, you know, like some, I, I forget, I, I think at one point we even defined the head instructor as some some kind of thing that was inside there. And it was just, it was just, uh, it's, a mud, it's a muddy section. I mean, we essentially follow the previous uh, thing that had service workers on it. Uh, there were some clarifications in that one about like how many people can they supervise and mm -hmm. yada 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 and and that worked out okay because we just made those people the clinical director and the assistant clinical director and that worked out okay but it's still just just for the future it's still a little bit muddy i'm not entirely clear but we just followed the guidelines from the previous itineration of the rules yeah i went with those um i don't know did you find anything else ashley as we were going through these or the, the... No, Honestly, Cliff, it was the same thing that stood out to me is like, what does this definition fit and who does it apply to in the organization? So that just took some time to, to suss out essentially. Yeah, just kind of the waddle our way through that one. So just for future reference, it's a, it's a little bit of a muddy section for, for at least for, for Blue Fire, it's a muddy section. Okay. Yeah, and I think we. Sorry, we did talk a little bit about some of those things and because we're writing rule for any outdoor program that comes to Idaho, right. right? And then we depend on the businesses to define who's who and what's what and what they, we don't really care what, what people call these positions. We have to give it a name, right? In some sense. So that is that I hear what you're saying. That would be hard. Um, coming in with a different business model right but anyone that comes in may have a whole different business model too so all, all, I'm, all i'm saying is is that it might be helpful to have a discussion with people about what that what, what those roles are and what the roles inside the organization was um i mean i did i did i did simple things like um 
I think that in this process, you know, Blue Fire doesn't have a technically does not have a chief executive, a chief administrator. They have an executive director. And I just like, which is the same thing. Right. right. So I just went through there and made sure that I went like, you know, Blue Fire has a, a chief administrator that we call an executive director. <laughs> like, right. I looked yeah. all the way through there. Right. And so yeah. and so so I use those kind of that kind of uh, rhetoric to kind of like clean up uh kind of what those roles were a little bit so that we yeah. a case manager supervisor is a clinical director and, and like a case manager is a, is a therapist and all that kind of roles that we fit so hopefully that's okay for you all yeah that's oh your- yeah that's perfect that's a, that's exactly right um because a lot of organizations right have different titles than what right. than what we use so they just have to match it up yeah, yeah. That, that's we, exactly I mean, what i that's exactly oh. what i explained to the people was it's like the difference between what the um, the title of your job is and the role inside the organization from a regulatory standpoint. Those yeah. are the, the difference. So and we often yeah. ask like at survey, we're like, who do you identify as this person or who do you identify as this person? Just so everybody's on the same page. Cause yeah, like Kelly said, it's across every organization. It can be very, very different. So that's, that's, that's great. Okay. Can yeah. I see if there's anything else that was a little bit of a muddle? Kelly, I messaged you. Is it possible to get a copy of that slideshow that you were presenting? We will post it. Okay. Yep. Can I see if there's anything else? Do you remember anything else, Ashley? Any other parts? Nothing off the top of my head. I feel like my most pertinent questions were answered today. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, you guys. So, you know, we'll see you in a few months at the end of the summer. Oh, you, you're not going to see me. You know, like, <laughs> you're retired already. I wasn't expecting to see you today. <laughs> well, they asked me to be here today because I was the one that wrote all their policies. So I'm the one that did that. So uh, you're still not off the hook. Not quite yet, uh, but I, yeah, I, you won't see me when you go by. Uh, hopefully I'll be on my sailboat in the, in the Sea of oh. Cortez about that time. So I'll, wow. I should be out. Yeah, exactly. Well, you enjoy your retirement. You, you Thank are- you. Thank you. Hopefully I was uh, behaved enough today for you guys. You're great. Great. (laughs) Thank you guys. Thanks. Have a good day. You too. Bye, Ashley. Bye. Bye all.